This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning a new guest to uh, Macro Analytics, Richard Duncan. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Gord. It's very nice to be here. Well, Richard, maybe we can begin by you giving our listeners just a sense of your background, uh, your writings, and your current involvements. Okay. Well, my career started when I moved to Hong Kong in 1986. I was 25. I enjoyed joined the investment industry then and worked for stockbroking companies and fund management companies, and have spent most of my career in, in Asia. Uh, along the way, I've written three books on the global economic crisis. The dollar crisis was the first, and the last one was called The New Depression. It came out last year. And in my career, I've worked for the World Bank in Washington and stockbroking companies, James Capel and Solomon Brothers, running research departments in Bangkok. And a few years ago, I was the head of global investment strategy for ABN AMRO Asset Management uh, based in London. Now my latest venture is I've just launched a new quarterly newsletter I call Macro Watch, and it appears in a, a video format. It focuses on analyzing trends in credit growth, liquidity, and government policy in order to anticipate how they're going to impact asset prices and economic growth. I asked Richard to, to join us here today because of the three books that he mentioned that he's written, The Dollar Crisis, The Corruption of Capitalism, and his most recent, The New Depression, The Breakdown of the Paper Money Economy, because I really thought these would allow, I believe, our listeners to have a better view of what is going on currently in the context of some very good work, as I said, that he's, he's done. Now, Richard has brought some some slides with him today, so we're going to use those as a vehicle to step through that the kind of distill a lot of his writings and his thinkings into some key concepts. And really, I can see that uh, you have a strong Austrian background. Is that a fair statement? Yes, it's fair uh, in that I believe the Austrians were spot on in understanding the role that credit plays in creating economic boom and bust cycles. Well, my my education in bubblenomics came in Thailand during the early 1990s. I was here running a large research department for a, a broking company, stock broking company, and I watched Thailand turn into a very large economic bubble and then implode. And it was clear what was driving it. It was being driven by a very rapid credit growth that was made possible by very large inflows of, of U.S. dollars. I believe that everything changed in 1968 when the United States stopped backing dollars with gold. Up until then, it was a law that the Fed had to maintain at least 25% gold backing for every dollar that it issued. But in 1968, they changed that law. And afterwards, we, so we moved from a money, from a gold backed monetary system to a pure fiat monetary system. And afterwards, that allowed the Fed to issue practically 25 times as many paper dollars since 1968 as existed in 1968. But most importantly, that break between dollars and gold, that removed all the constraints on how much credit could be created. And afterwards, credit absolutely exploded. Richard, you say 1968, and I agree with you, but most people would perceive that it was August of 1971 when we officially came off the gold standard. What was transacting in that period of time? 68 was when Congress at the request of President Johnson, changed the law so that the Fed no longer had to back the dollars it issued with gold. But 1971 was, the, I would say, the final nail in the coffin. At that point, uh, up until then, the U.S. was still allowing the central banks of other countries to convert their dollars 
into U.S. gold. But in 1971, we really didn't have enough gold left, and Nixon cl closed the so-called gold window, and that was the end of the Bretton Woods international monetary system. Yeah, the French were demanding payment at that point in time. The reason I draw differentiation there, because it was the point in our development where we actually stopped paying our way and where we moved to actually consuming more than we produce. And it was the two big events were going on at that period, 68 through 71, was the Vietnam War, and it was the very first war that we did not increase taxes and make the public pay for. It was a war that we effectively just put it on a credit card. And the second part was Johnson's Great Society, where, in fact, we started to really increase the social net. Both of these without substantially increasing the tax burden to go with it. And the only way out of it was to increase the credit available. Is that a fair observation? Yes, I think that's exactly right. And when we did break the link between dollars and gold, that allowed an explosion of credit to occur. And the expansion of credit, well, total credit in the United States, debt and credit are you can say, are two sides of the same coin. And by total credit, what I mean is all the debt in the country, government debt, household sector debt, corporate debt, financial sector debt, all the debt. It first went through $1 trillion in 1964. And then over the next 43 years, by 2007, it expanded 50 times to $50 trillion. So we went from $1 trillion of debt to $50 trillion of debt in just 43 years. And that explosion of debt, credit, it created our world. It, it created the greatest global economic boom in history. The problem is, is now it appears that the debt can't expand any further because the private sector is incapable of repaying the debt it has already. Have we reached the point of debt saturation in the private sector? It seems that we have, in large part, in the United States because globalization, while it's resulted in many good things, it has, at the same time, been driving down the median income in the United States. So with income dropping, how can the debt levels continue to increase forever? I have a view that we're in a quiddity trap. I call it the globalization trap, where, in fact, because of this labor arbitrage that we've been able to have, where we've actually dropped down the amount of cost within manufacturing products and being able to really, in the United States, keep costs artificially low, when I say costs, the, the cost of a lot of the consumption items, what it's done is the goods and services per unit labor has been falling and therefore real, and additionally real disposable income itself has been falling so that the bottom line is we just are not getting aggregate demand growth at a sufficient growth rate that we've stalled ourselves out and the debt, the amount of debt that we have that we have to pay, the the fig on it is is consuming any true wealth creation. Because in a capitalist system, wealth is, in, at least an industrial-based one, the wealth has got to be out of production, and it's got to be out of savings, not out of printing it. Is that, is that making sense to you? Well, that definitely makes sense, but I think that our economic system has changed. I don't think we have a capitalist system anymore. <laughs> I agree with that, actually. We're not allowing it to work the way that it should work, and we've moved from it, I agree. Could you expand on that a little more? I think capitalism has basically died in World War II when the government took over complete control over the economy to fight and win the war. You know, capitalism was a system where the government played very little role, but now the U.S. government's spending 23% of GDP. And under capitalism, gold was money, and the government had nothing to do with it. But now the central bank prints the money and manipulates interest rates and inflates asset prices. But also, very interestingly, under capitalism, the economic growth dynamic worked like this. Businessmen would invest. Some of them would make a profit. They would save that profit, or in other words, accumulate capital, hence capitalism, and repeat the process. The growth dynamic was driven by investment and saving, investment and saving. That's how capitalism worked. But our system doesn't work like that. Our system's growth dynamic is entirely different. It's been driven by credit creation and consumption, and more credit creation and more consumption. And that's created very rapid economic growth for the last four or five decades, much more so than capitalism would have done. But this new system that I call creditism, rather than capitalism, now looks like it's 
teetering on the verge of collapse because it seems that credit can't expand any further. Have we reached the point of peak consumption? And I say that with the United States economy, we're a 70% consumption-driven economy. Can you sustain that when you've got an eroding industrial base and you have no savings and you have no investment? Well, it's interesting. Looking back to, say, the end of World War II, starting 1952, what I've seen, what I've noticed is that every year the total credit grew by less than 2%, adjusted for inflation, we had a recession. And that happened nine times since World War II. Every time credit grew by less than 2% adjusted for inflation, we had a recession. And the recession didn't end until we had another very large surge of credit expansion. So now, of course, the question is, are we going to have more credit growth or not? Because since World War II, credit growth has been driving economic growth. And it's hard to see where the credit growth is going to come from. Now, if you look at each of the big sectors of the U.S. economy, there are only really five of them. And the private sector seems incapable of taking on much more debt. Really, it's only been the expansion of the government's debt since this crisis started that's prevented us from collapsing into a new depression already. So that the outlook is not encouraging for more credit growth at least not private sector-driven credit growth. The restriction that troubles me the most always seems that credit is endless and the gimmicks that we've come up with to allow it to expand is whether, in fact, we're producing enough collateral to support credit because any kind of credit that goes out requires some kind of collateral bank backing. And I, I'm sensing and feeling that we have collapsing collateral, that is, non-performing loans, impaired malinvestment and mispricing, that itself is is uh, is causing a big problem, and and therefore even the whole concept of risk-free bonds is in serious question. I question whether a lot of our sovereign bonds are truly could even be considered AAA rated. But in, nevertheless, and it goes back to even taper. The big issue was the government was consuming most of the risk-free uh, collateral. Is that going to be a restricting problem of this credit growth? Because clearly they've got to keep in, increasing it. So after a four and a half decade, 50 fold, $50 trillion expansion of credit, there's the real danger now that if this credit begins to contract, that it will spiral down into a new Great Depression along the lines that the Austrian economist explained. And I believe the U.S. policymakers understand that. They're terrified that we could collapse into a new Great Depression with all the horrors that involved in the 1930s and perhaps even the 1940s. So the government policy is designed to ensure that credit continues to expand one way or the other, either through expanding government budget deficits and government debt or through quantitative easing, pushing up asset prices and creating a wealth effect that creates more consumption, uh, creates more collateral and allows more consumption. So I think in this new age of fiat money, we have a government-directed economic system with the government driving the economy by ensuring that credit continues to expand. So in order to understand what's going to happen next with the economy and with asset prices, I believe it's necessary to anticipate what the government policy is going to be next because it's the government policy that drives asset prices and economic growth. Is abonomics, if I can use that word, going to become the new model for a lot of the developed countries around the world to, in fact, increase um, the money supply and credit? It very well may be. The Japan crisis started 23 years ago. And at that point, around 1990, Japan's government debt was 60% of Japan's GDP. Now, after 23 years of having very low, large budget deficits every year, Japan's government debt is now 250% of Japan's GDP. Well, compare that to the U.S. In the U.S. now, the government debt is only 100% of U.S. GDP. But just imagine how much larger the U.S. government debt could become before it reached 250% of U.S. GDP. So I think, I think the sad reality is, is that a global economic bubble has been created by the fiat money and credit creation that's occurred since 1968, but now we are on government life support. 
without government intervention in the economy through expanding its debt and financing that debt with fiat money creation, there's a very real chance that we'll collapse into a new Great Depression. And so the policymakers realize that. So there's every reason to continue to believe that they're going to continue expanding the government debt and continue to finance that debt expansion with more fiat money creation. Clearly, they're locked in. Is there any way out for them? Is there any alternatives truly available? Well, it's not at all certain that there is a, a way out. I mean, I, the American public, of course, is very concerned with the high levels of debt, the government debt. And naturally, this would worry everyone who's aware of the situation. But I don't think that they, many people, and here's where I differ with the conventional Austrian school these days, that theory basically holds that now that we have created this credit bubble, we have no alternative but to allow it to pop. There's nothing we can do to prevent it from popping. So the sooner it pops, the better, because then everything will, after a few years, will be tough, but then everything will go back to the way it was before. Well, where I disagree with that is I think we've had such an enormous multi-decade credit bubble take shape that if this bubble pops, I don't think anyone alive today will live long enough to see the recovery. This is going to be a multi-decade long depression. And frankly, I'm not sure our civilization can survive that. So rather than taking the Austrian medicine, I think we need to look at Japan's example and understand that our government is going to respond in the same way that the Japanese government has responded over the last two decades. That is by expanding the level of U.S. government debt from where it is now to much higher levels. So what we should learn from Japan's experience, and here Abenomics comes back in, you know, Abenomics, Abe, Prime Minister Abe, he was just elected on the promise that he was going to expand government spending and force the central bank to print even more money. So what that tells me is that in a democracy, a democracy is not going to tolerate austerity for very, very long. So I believe that our government is going to spend trillions and trillions of dollars going forward. So how about this? Let's come up with a really good plan on how to spend that money. Instead of wasting it all on consumption and war, as we have been doing, let's come up with a plan of how to invest those trillions and trillions of dollars into productive capital assets that will generate a massive profit in the future. I believe that the government could invest on such an aggressive scale that it could induce a new technological revolution that would effectively lock in a new American century. That would take leadership and vision, and I'm afraid to say that I think we're a little short on both. Or it'll take a crisis and the ability to react in the proper manner, and we failed to do that in the previous crises. I don't mean to be cynical, but I'm and I, I, I do support your view. I think it's very optimistic, but I, I'm, I'm skeptical that we can get that kind of consensus, even within a single government. I guess I was just too close to what went on in Washington, D.C. here over the last eight weeks. You're right to be skeptical, and uh, frankly, I am skeptical also. But as an economist, I think it's rather than just writing that we are all doomed, I, my goal is to come up with a, at least a theoretical possibility to avoid that doom. And once we can agree that theoretically that would be possible, then the next step, as difficult as it and maybe impossible as it may be, would be to force it through the political system uh, to, to ensure that the government doesn't invest the money wisely rather than just wasting it all. But in all probability, they're going to continue doing what Japan has done and what we've been doing since the crisis started. We which is spending too much, wasting the money, that supporting the economy, but wasting the money on consumption and war. So that's probably the way it's going to play out for the next 10 to 15 years. And then ultimately it will end very badly. It may end even sooner than that. The whole global system is very fragile. As an old engineer, it's, it's a system that's never been stress tested. And there's so many moving parts that any given thing can break uh, and we can have contagion. And uh, we saw, I think we just saw the tip of it in 2008, how quickly things can start to spread with, you know, a $72 trillion shadow banking system with $700 trillion in a, basically a, an unregulated offshore 
and swaps marketplace, I, I see so many opportunities for for a problem and just could absolutely swamp the system. And I agree with you. The the recovery from some of this could be almost irreparable. It's almost like Humpty Dumpty. You you might not be able to put the pieces back together again. Our economies are so interwined and so fragile. Well, that's right. If you compare what occurred during the Great Depression and what has occurred now, the, the two crises followed very similar patterns. In my opinion, the Great Depression originated, really, it got originated, you could say, in World War I. When all the European countries went to war with one another, they didn't have enough gold to fight the, the war. So they went off the classical gold standard and started printing a lot of paper money to finance the government bonds they were issuing. And all of that government debt and all of that fiat money during World War I, it led to a worldwide credit bubble that we call the Roaring Twenties. But in 1930, the credit couldn't be repaid, and the international banking system collapsed, and global trade collapsed. And policymakers didn't really have any idea what to do. They, they, you know, they believed in capitalism and laissez-faire. So they just stepped back and they let market forces reestablish a, a new market-determined equilibrium. And that's what happened. But unfortunately, that equilibrium was at a level of GDP that was 46% less than it had been in 1929, and with unemployment ranging between 15 to 25 percent all during the 1930s. And of course, as you know, during the 1930s, Germany became fascist and took over Europe. Japan turned militaristic and took over Asia. And then World War II started. And at that point, then the U.S. government increased its spending by 900 percent. And that ended the Depression, but World War II killed 60 million people. Now, this time, the pattern has been exactly the same up until the policy response. The Bretton Woods system broke down in 71. Afterwards, government started issuing enormous amounts of government debt and more recently fiat money creation. And that's led to a four-decade global economic boom. But in 2008, that credit couldn't be repaid. The international banking system started to break down. Global trade started to break down. But this time, the policy response has been entirely different. Rather than allowing market forces to work, Policymakers have intervened to prevent market forces from reestablishing a new market-determined equilibrium because the policymakers are terrified that that equilibrium would once again be at a level of GDP that's 30 or 40 percent less than it was in 2006. So the whole policy response is designed to continue to ensure that the global credit bubble remains inflated. And I believe that's what the policy response is going to continue to be. We recently saw uh, Richard in the, in the spring, where we are starting to talk about the concept of taper being implemented, with expectations of it potentially happening in in September. And and when that started to really take fruition in the press, all of the emerging countries, the emerging markets, some of the major BRICs, uh, Brazil, uh, India, uh, South Africa specifically, I saw it in Indonesia, I saw it in Turkey had complete collapses in their currencies. Their interest rates spiked up, and all of a sudden their stock markets were plummeting. And so the hot money turned around and went in reverse. And then suddenly we we, we backed off taper. Uh, we had summer's withdrawal, and all of a sudden that was even positive for those particular uh, markets. We stopped the threat of Syria, where that was a big issue in the G20 because the emerging markets were saying it was going to impact their economy significantly. But it really brought home how tenuous right now all of these peripheral countries are with independency on this hot money. And I think we just bought ourselves a little bit of time here, but I see a huge issue still looming in the future. Do you? Well, yes. The global economic bubble is still at least as large as it has ever been. And don't forget, the global economy is still driven by the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy is the driver of global economic growth. But the U.S. economy has been driven by credit expansion. And now credit is not expanding enough to drive the U.S. economy. So the globe, world trade is practically ground to a standstill. And the global economy is fundamentally very weak. So it... Uh, you know, the Fed has, has said repeatedly that tapering would depend on incoming data. Well, the incoming data was weak. And on top of that, we had the 
threat coming out of Washington of the government shutdown and possibly defaulting on the debt, so they didn't taper. But I don't think they're going to taper anytime soon because the incoming data is going to remain weak because credit growth is going to remain weak. Therefore, they're going to have to top up the credit growth with fiat money creation to generate enough growth to make the U.S. economy grow, to make U.S. imports grow so that the global economy can grow and so that this global economic bubble doesn't implode. And that's what they're going to do. So I think we'll have at least somewhere between half a trillion and a trillion dollars of QE in both 2014 and 2015, I would say at least in order to make the global economy grow. I would argue it's more than that. It's got to be substantial, and that's just the United States, never mind the total central banks of the major eights, what it's got to grow at. You have what investors should do in the age of fiat money. I have your chart up here uh, now in terms of monitoring credit growth and monitoring liquidity and specifically how to do that. Could you explain that to our listeners? Okay, well, first of all, it's very important to monitor credit growth because anything that causes credit growth to slow down is is going to mean that the economy is going to slow down. Credit growth drives economic growth. It's as simple as that in our new age of fiat money. So, for instance, this year the U.S. budget deficit is dropping quite sharply. Last year the budget deficit was something like $1.1 trillion. This year it's going to be more like $600 billion. So that means the government is going to borrow much less. In other words, the, credit, the debt growth or the credit growth will be much less there. That's going to act as a real drag on the economy. Um, and so it's not surprising we have such weak economic growth, and that's very likely to continue into next year. So credit, credit growth drives economic growth. And what I do in my newsletter is to monitor the credit growth in each of the major sectors of the economy to see whether overall credit growth in the United States is going to grow by more than the 2% threshold that we require to achieve economic growth or not. So that's one of my main focuses. Now, in terms of monitoring liquidity, I define liquidity. The government supplies liquidity when it creates fiat money. But And so there are two major sources of liquidity. There's the kind that we're most familiar with, which is quantitative easing. So that's obvious, and there's an enormous amount of liquidity coming from that source alone. This year, at $85 billion a month, that's more than a trillion dollars of paper money creation just during this year. So that's far more than is required to finance the entire U.S. budget deficit, which will be about 600 or $650 billion this year. So the Fed is effectively monetizing the entire budget deficit with another $400 plus billion dollars left over to go into other assets like other corporate bonds or stocks or property. And that's why we've had such stock market boom. But is it left over? Because we've got in the United States a $40 billion a month current account deficit right now. So in actual fact, those numbers actually turn out to be equal. <laughs> that's the other interesting thing. The current account is, another, in my opinion, that actually supplies liquidity to the U.S. Let me explain. So this year, the U.S. current account deficit is going to be, let's call it $500 billion. So that will that means that will throw out $500 billion into the global economy. That money will go to the trade surplus countries, primarily China. Now, so the dollars go into China, and the Chinese exporters who are taking the dollars into China they want to convert their dollars into the Chinese currency, the Chinese yuan. But if they did that in a free market and converted $500 billion into yuan, that would cause the Chinese currency to skyrocket, and that would kill China's export-led growth. So the central bank intervenes, and it buys all the dollars coming into China at a fixed exchange rate. But the, the important thing to understand is where the PBOC, the People's Bank of China, where did they get the $500 billion worth of renminbi or yuan that they use to buy the dollars. Well, they create it from thin air, just like the Fed does. So this year, they, the trade surplus countries, their central banks, will create the equivalent of $500 billion to buy the dollars coming into their country. And once they have these dollars, they have to reinvest the dollars into U.S. dollar-denominated assets. And so that's 
that's the second source of liquidity. The thing to understand is that when you look at a country's foreign exchange reserves, China now has three and a half trillion, three point seven trillion dollars of foreign exchange reserves. What that represents, what that tells us, is that China's central bank has created three point seven trillion dollars worth of their own currency and bought up three point seven trillion dollars in currency manipulation moves. But once they accumulate that money, they have to reinvest it in U.S. dollar assets, and so that's the second source of liquidity. So on top of the one trillion dollars of quantitative easing, that that's one trillion dollars of liquidity. On top of that, we're getting another five hundred tr- billion dollars of liquidity from our effectively from our current account deficit, and the central banks creating that amount of money from thin air to manipulate their currencies. So when you combine that, we've got something like one and a half trillion dollars of liquidity, whereas the governments only suck. All- only sucking out $600 billion of liquidity through their current account deficit, I mean, through their budget deficit, leaving, what is that, $900, $900 billion left to go into stocks and property and other bonds. And that's why we've got such a stock market boom going on and also even now a property price boom that's coming from the excess liquidity. So that's the second major thing that I focus on in my newsletter is is – Liquidity. You have metrics to track this and uh, statistics that are available to subscribers? Yes, I do. I create something that I call a liquidity gauge. And when the liquidity gauge is showing excess liquidity, that's a very good indication that asset prices are going to rise. And on the other hand, when it's showing a liquidity drought, as I call it, that's good reason to expect asset prices to fall. Are you seeing any kind of change in trend recently centered around the moves in taper? If you compare the size of the budget deficit to the size of the U.S. current account deficit, another way of thinking about the current account deficit is every country's balance of payments has to balance. So in 2006, for example, that was the peak of the U.S. current account deficit. That year, the United States had an $800 billion current account deficit. Well, because every country's balance of payments has to balance, that means that in 2006, the U.S. did have $800 billion of capital inflow into the United States. So every whatever the size of our current account deficit, we will have an equally large and offsetting capital inflow into the United States. So, and most most of that capital inflow is originating from the central banks of the trade surplus countries, who are creating their own money from thin air. But so it's very important to compare the size of the budget deficit to the size of the current account deficit because the current account deficit effectively represents incoming liquidity. And so for 12 years, between 1996 and 2008, the current account deficit was larger than the budget deficit. So it made it very easy for the government to finance the budget deficit at very low interest rates. And in fact, the excess liquidity that resulted in the the Nasdaq bubble, the stock market bubble, and the and the property bubble. But everything changed in 2000. And so let me elaborate. In 2006, as I've said, the current account deficit was 800 billion dollars, but that year the budget deficit was only 200 billion dollars. So foreign central banks could have bought every new treasury bond sold that year, and still they had $600 billion that they had to invest somewhere else. And that's what they did. So there's no 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 mystery about why we had such a property market bubble at that point. But in 2009, everything changed. Suddenly, our budget deficit tripled to $1.4 trillion, and the current account deficit shrank to only $400 billion. So suddenly, for the first time in more than 12 years, there was a $1 trillion funding gap that was not being financed by the current account deficit. And that's when quantitative easing started. Quantitative easing started to finance that funding gap. Otherwise, it would not have been possible for the government to finance a $1.4 trillion budget deficit at such ultra-low interest rates. So now, this year, once again, we have a very large amount of excess liquidity because, as I mentioned, we have something like $1.5 trillion of liquidity, but the government's only absorbing $600 billion of that. 
And that's creating a very, very favorable liquidity environment that's pushing up asset prices now. Do you see us having, well, I'll refer to it as a crack-up boom in front of us because of this? And especially as you expect them just to continue uh, increasing the credit? Well, I think the Fed doesn't want to have a crack-up boom. They don't want the stock market to go up 50% a year and then after a couple of years pop again and create a new systemic banking crisis. So I believe the Fed wants the stock market to go go up about, say, 10 or 15% every year in order to create a wealth effect so that the Americans will have some money to spend so that they can consume and and help drive the global economy. But they don't want the stock market to go up too much uh, for fear that it will lead to a new crisis, a new bubble, and the bubble will pop at systemic banking crisis. So I think it's an is necessary to anticipate what the Fed's trying to do. So, in my opinion, they're going to taper quantitative easing. In other words, they're manipulating the stock market, and they're going to manipulate it so that the stock market goes up 10 to 15% a year. If that requires less quantitative easing, then there will be less. But if that causes the market to overshoot on the downside, then they will re-accelerate quantitative easing so that the stock market goes back up again. We have a government-directed economic system that depends on credit growth in order to achieve economic growth. And so in order to foresee how this is going to play out, it's necessary to understand what the, the government's trying to do. And right now, it's really the Fed is in charge, and they're driving the global economy by creating an asset price, uh, uh, by creating asset price inflation in the United States. And there's really no reason that I should not be able to succeed in doing that for several more years. I agree. Generally, I question whether the levers of control allow them to handle it as delicately as it might, because as soon as they start to whisper something, the reactions are so violent, and then they start to spring into contagion and, and unintended consequences come out of it. So just saw the reaction even to taper uh, how it's washed around the world. So it's a very... It's, Impossible? No, but very, very, very difficult thing uh, to do. We're up against our hard line here, Richard. Time won't goes by very quickly. I took you off some of the slides you brought. Are there any key points from those that we missed that you'd like to uh, to raise or talk about? No, I think we covered most of it. Well, one of my points I would like to make is that in, in the old days, there was a very clear difference between money and credit. Money was gold and credit was credit. But after 1968, there really no longer is any difference between money and credit. After all, in the old days, if you took a dollar bill to the Treasury Department, they had to give you some gold for it. Now they just give you another dollar bill. So there's really no difference between a dollar bill and a 10-year Treasury bond. They're both credit instruments. One pays no interest and one pays next to no interest, but they're both credit instruments. So forget about the money supply. There's no point in monitoring the monetary aggregates anymore. M1, M2, M3, MZM, they're all irrelevant. What matters now is the credit supply. And we need credit growth to make the economy grow. So this is something I call the quantity theory of credit instead of the, it's an adaptation of the centuries-old quantity theory of money. But the important thing to understand is that there is no longer any difference between money and credit. And the amount of credit growth has been so extraordinary that it dwarfs the amount of money supply and makes it completely irrelevant. So if you want to understand what's going to go on, what's happening, what, how the economy is going to evolve from here, you have to understand whether credit is going to grow or not. And I, so that's what I focus on is trying to anticipate credit growth by looking at it from a sector-by-sector -sector basis. Could you tell our listeners, uh, Richard, how they could learn more about your work and certainly to get uh, information on Macro Watch? I would encourage your listeners to go to my website, which is richardduncaneconomics.com. And there it's possible to learn more about Macro Watch, my video newsletter. This this is a, it's a video newsletter. What I mean by that is effectively is me making PowerPoint presentations. And each one is roughly an hour long, broken into several segments. And it comes out quarterly. And the focus of Macro, Macro Watch is that it analyzes trends in credit growth, liquidity, and, and government policy 
in order to anticipate their impact on asset prices and economic growth, because that's the way the economy works in this new age of fiat money. So if your listeners can see this slide, I'm in this I'm offering a 50% discount for the next couple of weeks for, for your for your listeners. The coupon code for that is radio. So I hope you'll subscribe to Macro Watch. Richard, I appreciate the time that you've given us here this morning. Uh, fascinating. So many things to talk about. I apologize if I got us off track a few times. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope to have you back again. Gord, thank you very much for inviting me. I've enjoyed talking with you. So catch you again. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com. <laughs>